the ambitious goose by gothold ephraim lessing 1729 to 1781 read for librivox.org the ambitious goose among the vexations our tempers to try sure vanity brings us the largest supply tis a failing though common all find of no use i hope no young gent will ever act like my goose the fowl that i speak of a fine-looking bird how much i regret she could be so absurd was so plump and so fat of white plumage profuse that she looked like a very respectable goose but it was not sufficient in her silly mind to act well in the station by nature assigned she envied the swans and she fled with abuse from her more humble tribe what a vain giddy goose to the lake then she waddled and joining the swan she stretched out her neck and she tried to be one but such laughter and scorn did her efforts produce all the birds in the air mocked the poor silly goose and all who sat near for twas late in the day did with wisdom and truth and much gravity say by your freaks of ambition and folly let loose you're not only no swan but a very bad goose end of poem this recording is in the public domain autumn by john clare read for librivox .org by ian king the thistle down's flying though the winds are all still on the green grass now lying now mounting the hill the spring from the fountain now boils like a pot through stones past the counting it bubbles red hot the ground parched and cracked is like overbaked bread the greensward all racked is bent dried up and dead the fallow fields glitter like water indeed and gossamers twitter flung from weed unto weed hilltops like hot iron glitter bright in the sun and the rivers we're eyeing burn to gold as they run burning hot is the ground liquid gold is the air whoever looks round sees eternity there End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Brahm by Joseph Furphy. Read for LibriVox by Josh Middledorf. A spectral film that came and went in its elusive way gave vent in some unreal words which meant, I think, therefore I am that phantasm only thought it thought, a vain conception crudely wrought, an egotistic sham, which brings us up against the fact by Trunder's attestation backed, there is no substance, thought, nor act, nothing exists but Brahm. This quaint contraption here below is not a magic shadow show where phantom figures come and go as held by old Kayam, a show has time and space enough, but here we only have such stuff as dreams are made of, mental fluff, and visionary flam. Throughout the universal scheme, be sure things are not what they seem, to quote a well-known psalm. They're only whimsies of a dream, a transient dream of Brahm. All through the cycles of the past, at which notation stands aghast, he has subsisted, first and last, lone, functionless, and calm. Nothing extraneous can obtrude upon his Sabbath quietude, or discompose his tranquil mood, for nothing is but Brahm. The past and present here unite beneath time's flowing tide, to cite a bard of Uncle Sam. For time stretched out in eons dim to apprehension's very rim is insignificant to him, a bagatelle to Brahm. For once in his negation deep, he somehow chanced to drop asleep, and through that forty wings there ran a flitting dream. So time began, 
he dreamed this stellar lens of ours which mocks at telescopic powers innumerable suns sublime at furious speed yet keeping time and so remote that to the eye they look like fixtures in the sky but that's a trifle round about a million light-years further out the wisps of nebula portend sidereal schemes without an end and this is no poetic flight nor idiotic blatherskite nor what is termed a cram however vast these plans may seem they're only figments of a dream a trifling dream by brahm he dreamed our system's fiery gas condensing into solid mass and during several billion years evolving planetary spheres but take this globe alone to prove how things have moved or seemed to move he dreamed some pulpy form of life mutation slow and savage strife with nature's forces all in play and darwin's system under way white bits of hide and tufts of hair for countless centuries filled the air and only those were left alive whose fitness caused them to survive monsters that lived in gulfs of slime with names that balk and baffle rhyme prodigious sloths whose daily food was half a ton of leaves and wood grim saurians of terrific strength a quarter of a mile in length unsightly bats with twelve-foot wings and endless tribes of fearsome things culled down in point of fact so fit that they should thrive in shoals pit and breathe its exhalation thick holding their own with ancient nick and so while ocean bottoms rose to stand awhile as high plateaus and mountains sank beneath the main to rise time after time again and rocks were formed and strata rent and polar ice caps came and went and geological ages passed each an improvement on the last and on the wrinkled crust of earth more decent forms of life had birth man was evolved a product queer a breed that it would pay to shear and which it might be safe to say has reached a higher stage to-day since restless generations gone have passed a few ideas on but bear in mind this human race diverse in colour smell and face these offshoots from the simian stem the sons of japheth and of shem the progeny of ham with mongrel race that infests the isles and mainlands east and west from chile to siam are less than ripples in a stream they're only ripples on a dream namely the dream of brahm even that race divinely nursed which for its virtues has been cursed and booted into seven times seven by every nation under heaven the seed of abraham and those brave lions in their den each one a match for aliens ten with fist or rifle bat or pen i mean god's modest englishmen whose very fog is balm these are less tangible withal than shadowy rabbits on the wall nothing exists but brahm our swarming brethren of the north whatever you may judge them worth sling muck and sugu ram and fantoids like yourself and me though differing somewhat in degree nothing exists but brahm that fat man dining at his club on costly wet and sumptuous grub the pilgrims in their roadside pub the washerwoman at her tub and jacky in his native scrub on bandicoot and yam are momentary sports of thought that flicker out and come to naught in this brief dream of brahm illusion in the very air if such an envelope were there and things that seem to calm your care your wife with her untidy hair and grandma in her easy chair and baby in the pram are all a visionary crew which fact need never worry you for you're an apparition too nothing exists but brahm but flies are in the ointment sweet and jumpers in the cheese we eat and maggots in the treacherous meat and mildew on the jam that is to say we might complain of many a kink in things mundane of barbarisms that still remain from instance sport imposing pain monarchial loyalty inane 
and gnats at which the wowsers strain, the camels that they entertain, sectarian bigotry insane, the ruthless quest of sordid gain, a sad perennial stream of bane, which only in a sense profane we're competent to damn, the feckless poet's cult of grog, the idle bummer's cadge for prog, the stern official's odious gog, the flumphy's meek salam, such provocations daily met, and grounds of meddlesome regret, shall find their panacea yet, with rattling promptitude you bet, in this same dream of Brahm. Unquestionably no one knows the likely period of his doze, but this we know, that when he wakes, we vanish in a breaks of shakes, without dismay or qualm, the earth, the sun, and every star shall vanish like the freaks they are. The corn and oil, the flower and grass, the fig and vine shall simply pass. The eucalypt and the palm, the microbe small, the ponderous whale, the greyhound swift, the tardy snail, the lion and the lamb. The sand and granite, quartz and schist shall vanish like a vaporous mist which the fictitious sun has kissed. Of course, they never did exist. Nothing exists but Brahm. End of Brahm by Joseph Furphy Brevity of Life by Francis Quarles Read for LibriVox.org by Phil Schempf Behold, how short a span was long enough of old to measure out the life of man. In those well-tempered days, his time was then surveyed, cast up, and found but threescore years and ten. Alas, and what is that? They come and slide and pass, before my pen can tell thee what. The posts of time are swift, which having run their seven short stages o'er, their short-lived task is done. Our days begun, we lend to sleep, to antic plays toys, until the first stage end twelve waning moons twice five times told we give to unrecovered loss we rather breathe than live how vain how wretched is poor man that doth remain a slave to such a state as this his days are short at longest few at most they are but bad at best yet lavished out or lost they be the secret springs that make our minutes flee on wheels more swift than eagle's wings our life's a clock and every gasp of breath breathes forth a warning grief till time shall strike a death how soon our newborn light attains to full aged noon and this how soon to gray-haired night we spring we bud we blossom and we blast ere we can count our days our days they flee so fast they end when scarce begun and ere we apprehend that we begin to live our life is done man count thy days and if they fly too fast for thy dull thoughts to count count every day thy last end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Crepuscule by E. E. Cummings Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp I will wade out till my thighs are steeped in burning flowers. I will take the sun in my mouth and leap into the ripe air, alive with closed eyes to dash against darkness. In the sleeping curves of my body shall enter fingers of smooth mastery. With chasteness of sea-girls will I complete the mystery of my flesh. I will rise after a thousand years, lipping flowers, and set my teeth in the silver of the moon. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Discontented Horse by Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, 1729 to 1781. 
read for LibriVox.org. The Discontented Horse As Jupiter once was receiving petitions from birds and from beasts of all ranks and conditions, with an eye full of fire and mane quite erect, which I'm sorry to say showed but little respect, the horse went as near as he dared to the throne, and thus made his donkey-like sentiments known for beauty of symmetry fleetness and force it is said that all animals yield to the horse while my spirit i feel and my figure i view in the brook i'm inclined to believe it is true but still mighty jupiter still by your aid in my form might some further improvements be made to run is my duty and swifter and stronger i surely would go were my legs to be longer and as man always places a seat on my back i should have been made with a saddle or sack it have saved him much trouble on journeys departing and i had been constantly ready for starting great jupiter smiled for he laughed at the brute as he saw more of folly than vice in his suit and striking the earth with omnipotent force a camel arose near the terrified horse he trembled he started his mane shook with fright and he staggered half round as preparing for flight behold exclaimed jove there an animal stands with both your improvements at once to your hands his legs are much longer the hump on his back well answers the purpose of saddle or sack of your shapes tell me which is more finished and trim speak out silly horse would you wish to be him the horse looked abashed and had nothing to say and jove with reproaches thus sent him away be gone till you gratefully feel and express your thanks for the blessings and gifts you possess the camel though plain is mild useful and good you are handsome but proud discontented and rude end of poem this recording is in the public domain Epitaph by E. E. Cummings Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Tumbling hair picker of buttercups, violets, dandelions, and the big bullying daisies, Through the field, wonderful with eyes a little sorry, another comes, also picking flowers. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. The Excellent Way by Robert Bridges Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk Man's mind that hath this earth for home Hath to its far-spread starry dome Where thought is lost in going free prisoned but by infinity he first in slumbrous babyhood took conscience of his heavenly good then with his sins grown up to youth wept at the vision of god's truth soon in his heart new hopes awoke as poets sang or prophets spoke temples arose and stone he taught to stand a gaze in tranced thought he won the trembling air to tell of far passions ineffable feeding the hungry things of sense with instincts of omniscience immortal modes that should abide cherished by love and pious pride that unborn children might inherit the triumph of his holy spirit outbidding nature to entice her soul from her own paradise till her wild face had fallen to shame had he not praised her in god's name alas poor man what blockish curse would violate thy universe to enchain thy freedom and entomb thy pleasance in devouring gloom behold thy savage foes of yore with woes of pestilence and war shiva and moloch odin and thor 
rise from their graves to greet amain the deeds that give them life again poor man sunk deeper than thy slime in blood and hate in terror and crime thou who wert lifted on the wings of thy desire the king of kings in promise beyond ken sublime o oh, thou man's soul who mightest climb to heavenly happiness whereof thine easy path were mirth and love end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Vinny by E. E. Cummings. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. Over silent waters, day descending, night ascending, floods the gentle glory of the sunset in a golden greeting splendidly to westward as pale twilight trembles into darkness comes the last light's gracious exhortation lifting up to peace so when life shall falter standing on the shores of the eternal god may i behold my sunset flooding over silent waters and the poem this recording is in the public domain. The Flower of Night by Samuel Lover Read for LibriVox.org by Melanie T. There is an Indian tree, they say, Whose timid flower avoids the light, Concealing thus from tell-tale day The beauties it unfolds at night so many a thought may hidden lie so sighs unbreathed by day may be which freely neath the starry sky in secret faith i give to thee the love that strays through pleasure's ways is like the flowers that love the light but love that's deep and faith will keep is like the flower that blooms at night then do not blame my careless mien amid this world of maskers gay i would not let my heart be seen i wear a mask as well as they ah who would wish the gay should smile at passion too refined for them and therefore i with blameless guile conceal within my heart the gem the love that strays through pleasure's ways is like the flowers that love the light but love that's deep and faith will keep is like the flower that blooms at night end of poem this recording is in the public domain fly catchers by robert bridges read for LibriVox.org by bruce kachuk sweet pretty fledglings perched on the rail a row expectantly happy where ye can watch below your parents a hunting i the meadow grasses all the gay morning to feed you with flies ye recall me a time sixty summers ago when a young chubby chap i sat just so with others on a school form ranked in a row not less eager and hungry than you i trow with intelligences agape and eyes aglow while an authoritative old wise acre stood over us and from a desk fed us with flies dead flies such as litter the library south window that buzzed at the panes until they fell stiff baked on the sill or are rolled up asleep i the blinds at sunrise or wafered flat in a shrunken folio 
a dry biped he was nurtured likewise on skins and skeletons stale from top to toe with all manner of rubbish and all manner of lies end of poem this recording is in the public domain Hark to the Wind of the World by Grace Fallow Norton Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo Hark to the Wind of the World The shafts of my life are far hurled I cannot belong to you I belong to the cataract leaping I belong to the west wind weeping I belong to the white swan sleeping I belong to the wild curlew. Away, I say it must end. Call me not, call me not friend. I am false, for I must be true. I belong to the cedar swinging. I belong to the silence ringing. I belong to the noon sun singing, where the singing god reed grew. Go further, further away. I will walk with you yet some day, but I will not belong to you. I belong to the eagle flying. I belong to the sea tide sighing. I belong to the wilderness crying. I belong to dawn and the dew. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In Harvest Time by Charles Maurice Stebbins Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Olson Feitak, Los Angeles In Harvest Time It was a day in harvest time And as I wandered through the fields of yellow grain Some softly waved beneath the mild caresses of the wind Some was in fresh lane swathes and some lay bound in mellow sheaves oh the mysterious work of time oh the creative love in sun oh the enlivening power in rain only a few short months ago the seeds were scattered on the ground the little blades sprang to the light and grew perfected in the ear and now the harvest fully ripe I thought and wandered on once more, and found, stretched out to rest upon the prostrate grain, his scythe close by, the mower spent with heat and toil. His face was thin and wrinkled much, grey were his hair and beard with age, weary with age and toil, I thought, and at the thought my heart grew sad to live on this fair earth is sweet and youth is full of happiness then why must we each one grow old into the far-off skies i cried my eyes fell on the ripened grain and read reply because the harvest is better than the growing grain end of poem this recording is in the public domain Heart's Holiday by Grace Fallow Norton Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo Without a city's whirling dust, a city's alley wall, Without a bleak pale strip of sky, within high festival, Without no greeting between friends, from the hurrying crowd no smile within my heart's slow pageant moves in glorious solemn file there was no call for revel day who summons us each morn came forth in drearious garb and blue no gala herald horn but slave of day i am not nay 
her mistress still i wield the crystal sceptre of my mood bearing my dream's white shield exultant rapture flooded mad with mystic inner mirth my heart holds her strange carnival unseen of all the earth end of poem this recording is in the public domain hell and hate by robert bridges read for LibriVox.org by bruce gachuk two demons thrust their arms out over the world hell with a ruddy torch of fire and hate with gasping mouth striving to seize two children fair who played on the upper curve of the earth their shapes were vast as the thoughts of man but the earth was small as the moon's rim appeareth scanned through an optic glass the younger child stood erect on the earth as a charioteer in a car or a dancer with arm upraised her whole form barely clad from feet to golden head leapt brightly against the uttermost azure whereon the stars were splashes of light dazed in the gulfing beds of space the elder might have been stelled to show the lady who led my boyish love but her face was graver than e'er to me when i looked in her eyes long ago and the hair on her shoulders fallen nested its luminous brown i the downy spring of her wings her figure aneath was screened by the earth whereof so small that was no footing for her could be she appeared to be sailing free i the glide and poise of her flight then knew i the angel faith who was guarding human love happy were both of peaceful mien contented as mankind longeth to be not merry as children are and showed no fear of the fiend's pursuit as ever those demons clutched in vain and i who had feared awhile to see such gentleness in such jeopardy lost fear myself for i saw the foes were slipping aback and had no hold on the round earth that sped its course the painted figures never could move but the artist's mind was there the longer i looked the more i knew they were falling falling away below to the darkness out of sight end of poem this recording is in the public domain the listeners by walter de la mer read for LibriVox.org by algy pug is there anybody there said the traveller knocking on the moonlit door and his horse in the silence champed the grasses of the forest's ferny floor and a bird flew up out of the turret above the traveller's head and he smote upon the door again a second time is there anybody there he said but no one descended to the traveller no head from the leaf-fringed sill leaned over and looked into his grey eyes where he stood perplexed and still but only a host of phantom listeners that dwelt in the lone house then stood listening in the quiet of the moonlight to that voice from the world of men stood thronging the faint moonbeams on the dark stair that goes down to the empty hall hearkening in an air stirred and shaken by the lonely traveller's call and he felt in his heart their strangeness their stillness answering his cry while his horse moved cropping the dark turf 
neath a starred and leafy sky for he suddenly smote on the door even louder and lifted his head tell them i came and no one answered that i kept my word he said never the least stir made the listeners though every word he spake fell echoing through the shadowiness of the still house from the one man left awake ay they heard his foot upon the stirrup and the sound of iron on stone and how the silence surged softly backward when the plunging hoofs were gone end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Little Ghost by Edna St. Vincent Millay Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter I knew her for a little ghost that in my garden walked. The wall is high, higher than most, and the green gate was locked. And yet I did not think of that till after she was gone. I knew her by the broad white hat, all ruffled she had on. By the dear ruffles round her feet, by her small hands that hung in their lace mitts, austere and sweet, her gown's white folds among. I watched to see if she would stay, what she would do, and oh, she looked as if she liked the way I let my garden grow. She bent above my favorite mint with conscious garden grace. She smiled and smiled. There was no hint of sadness in her face. She held her gown on either side to let her slippers show, and up the walk she went with pride, the way great ladies go. And where the wall is built anew and is of ivy bare, she paused, then opened and passed through a gate that once was there. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. It was the lovely moon by John Freeman, read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug. It was the lovely moon. She lifted slowly her white brow among bronze cloud waves that ebbed and drifted faintly, faintly afar. Calm she looked, yet pale with wonder sweet in unwonted thoughtfulness watching the earth that dwindled under faintly faintly afar it was a lovely moon that love-like hovered over the wandering tired earth her bosom grey and dove-like hovering beautiful as a dove the lovely moon her soft light falling lightly on roof and poplar and pine tree to tree whispering and calling wonderful in the silvery shine oh the round lovely thoughtful moon end of poem this librivox recording is in the public domain measure by e r dodds read for LibriVox.org by matt perard i think we are made the prisoners of the sun snared in the waxing and the waning passion lest life should grow intense to burn up sense and lose life's fashion in the unfashioned one i believe the cool unlaboring dark is sent swift on the wildness of the day's mad ending lest the delight of fire consume desire and in love's spending love itself be spent i believe the rain-soft autumn has its task to curb the stretched importunate flame of summer for fear too strong a fever should quite dissever the invisible murmur from the coloured mask this is the sun's wisdom that change and rest and change the embodied world's recurrent measure in check and counterpoise contain all joys lest the one treasure perish being possessed end of poem this recording is in the public domain
the messenger of death by john stagg read for LibriVox.org by newgate novelist rise from your couch fair lady jane and drive the slumbers from your e rise from your couch fair lady jane for i have tidings brought for thee but seldom slumbers lady jane but seldom visits sleep her e o oh, wakeful rendered by her woe yet say what tidings bring'st thou me loud blustering howls the wintry gale hark how the neighbouring torrents pour i fear tis but some wanton wight that mocks me at this midnight hour shake off thy slumbers lady jane rise from thy couch and come away shake off thy slumbers lady jane for i'm in haste and must not stay say stranger what can be thy haste or what may this thine errand be from whom and wherefore art thou sent or say what tidings bring'st thou me lord walter he my wedded lord now wins on fair esperia's plains where proud britannia's banners fly where death and devastation reigns three months are scarcely past and gone though three long tedious months to me since brave lord walter left these arms and with his squadrons put to sea though long and tedious seems the time yet well i ween too short by far to think of news from him my lord or tidings from the woeful war rise from thy couch fair lady jane rise from thy couch and follow me tis from lord walter's self i come i am his messenger to thee bleak o'er the heath the whirlwind blows fast falls the rain as fast can be yet since thou bear'st my lord's behest i'll leave my couch and come to thee but tell me stranger tell me where lord walter wins and how he fares for though from him i fain would hear my bosom labours with its cares would it become lord walter's wife would it become his lady jane at midnight hour to leave her couch and with a stranger walk the plain rise from thy couch thou lady jane arise and make no more delay the night's far spent and i'm in haste and here i must no longer stay near where the foaming derwent rolls its currents westward to the sea there on the beach by solway's side lord walter anxious waits for thee swift to her well-known master's call up from the brake the falcon springs and to the whistling summons highs in eager speed on outstretched wings so from her couch sprang lady jane in sooth she was not slack nor slow nor feared she once the drenching rain nor cared she how the winds might blow and she's put on her kirtle green her scarf and mantle made of blue and donned her up with mickle haste her midnight journey to pursue and she's unbarred the outer door and ventured midst the wind and rain and with the urgent stranger sped all storm-struck o'er the dreary plain o'er hill and dale through bog and burn and many a glen they swiftly hide nor spoke they once nor stopped nor stayed until they reached the solway side the night was dark the boisterous main impetuous dashed against the shore and oft the water sprite was heard to shriek with loud terrific roar where is my love said lady jane oh bring lord walter quick to me i see the sea i see the shore but no lord walter can i see 
o oh, lady jane the stranger cried fair lady ever kind and true why shrink you thus with foolish fear lord walter's spirit speaks to you in biscay's well-known stormy bay our vessel sank no more to rise there buried in a watery grave all cold thy long-loved husband lies constant and kind to me in life thou heldst dominion o'er my heart our love was mutual then shall death our love so well established part cold horror seized fair lady jane her frame with deadly terror shook an icy coldness chilled her blood and motion every pulse forsook with silent and insensate stare she viewed the spectre o'er and o'er but such an awful hideous sight her eyes had never seen before all deadly meagre gloomed his face of flesh by hideous monsters stripped sea bubbles filled his vacant eyes and from his clothes the waters dripped his temples once so comely fair were now with seaweed compassed round and filthy coils of tangle foul the parts of his fair body bound when thus with hollow voice once more the phantom said however it be you must to-night fair lady jane expect to sleep in death with me she shrieked and lifeless on the shore she fell when swift a swelling wave rolled o'er her and with its recoil entombed her in a watery grave no more was heard of lady jane lord walter he was seen no more save that the neighbours sometimes see their spirits wander by the shore and oft amidst the whirlwind's blast is heard full many a hideous scream and two strange figures often glide along the side of derwent stream End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Have a very happy Halloween. Modern Florence by L. Read for LibriVox.org by Oshiro. Hard by the home of Dante's infant life, I saw Yankee cakewalk at the ties. Within San Miniato's pillared eyes a japanese was peering unsurprised where michelangelo sat dawn and night and her most blessed who softly sculptured smile glows with a maiden's and a mother's light a german jew was nagging with his wife end of poem this recording is in the public domain Music Comes by John Freeman Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Music comes sweetly from the trembling string When wizard fingers sweep dreamily, half asleep When through remembering reeds Ancient airs and murmurs creep Oboe, oboe following Flute answering clear high flute Voices, voices Falling mute and the jarring drums at night I heard, first, a waking bird, out of the quiet darkness, sing. Music comes strangely to the brain asleep. And I heard soft, wizard fingers sweep music from the trembling string. And through remembering reeds, ancient airs and murmurs creep, oboe, oboe following, flute calling clear high flute, voices faint, falling mute, and low jarring drums 
then all those airs sweetly jangled newly strange rich with change was it the wind in the reeds did the wind range over the trembling string into flute and oboe pouring solemn music sinking soaring low to high up and down the sky was it the wind jarring drowsy far-off drums strangely to the brain asleep music comes end of poem this librivox recording is in the public domain mutability or the flower that smiles today by percy bysshe shelley read for LibriVox.org by phil Schempf. the flower that smiles today tomorrow dies all that we wish to stay tempts and then flies what is this world's delight lightning that mocks the night brief even as bright virtue how frail it is friendship how rare love how it sells poor bliss for proud despair but we though soon they fall survive their joy and all which ours we call whilst skies are blue and bright whilst flowers are gay whilst eyes that change ere night make glad the day whilst yet the calm hours creep dream thou and from thy sleep then wake to weep and a poem this recording is in the public domain. My Aunt's Spectre by Mortimer Collins Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter They tell me, but I really can't imagine such a rum thing. It is a phantom of my aunt, who ran away, or something. It is the very worst of bores my aunt was most delightful it prowls about the corridors and utters noises frightful at midnight through the rooms it glides behaving very coolly our hearts all throb against our sides the lights are burning bluely the lady in her living hours was the most charming vixen that ever this poor sex of ours delighted to play tricks on yes that's her portrait on the wall in quaint old-fashioned bodice her eyes are blue her waist is small a ghost pooh pooh a goddess a fine patrician shape to suit my dear old father's sister lips softly curved a dainty foot happy the man that kissed her light hair of crisp irregular curl over fair shoulders scattered egad she was a pretty girl unless sir thomas flattered and who the deuce in these bright days could possibly expect her to take to dissipated ways and plague us as a spectre end of poem this recording is in the public domain october's bright blue weather by Helen Hunt Jackson, read for LibriVox.org by Ian King. O oh, suns and skies and clouds of June, and flowers of June together, you cannot rival for one hour October's bright blue weather. When loud the bumblebee makes haste, belated, thriftless, vagrant, and golden rod is dying fast, and lanes with grapes are fragrant when gentians roll their fingers tight to save them for the morning and chestnuts fall from satin burrs without a sound of warning when on the ground red apples lie in piles like jewels shining and redder still on old stone walls are leaves of woodbine twining when all the lovely wayside things their white-winged seeds are sowing and in the fields still green and fair late aftermaths are growing when springs run low and on the brooks in idle golden freighting bright leaves sink noiseless in the hush of woods for winter waiting when comrades 
seek sweet country haunts by twos and twos together and count like misers hour by hour october's bright blue weather o oh, sun and skies and flowers of june count all your boasts together love loveth best of all the year october's bright blue weather End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. October by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Read for LibriVox.org by Ian King. October is the treasurer of the year, and all the months pay bounty to her store. The fields and orchards still their tribute bear, and fill her brimming coffers more and more. But she, with youthful lavishness, spends all her wealth in gaudy dress, and decks herself in garments bold of scarlet, purple, red, and gold. She heedeth not how swift the hours fly, but smiles and sings her happy life along. She only sees above a shining sky, she only hears the breeze's voice in song. Her garments trail the woodland through and gather pearls of early dew that sparkle till the roguish sun creeps up and steals them every one. But what cares she that jewels should be lost when all of nature's bounteous wealth is hers? Though princely fortunes may have been their cost, not one regret her calm demeanour stirs. Wholehearted, happy, careless, free, she lives her life out joyously, nor cares when frost stalks o'er her way and turns her auburn locks to grey. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Searchlights on the Mercy by Anonymous, read for LibriVox.org, by Sonia. Searchlights on the Mercy A long lean bar of silver spans the ebon-rippled waterway, and like a lost moon's errant ray strikes on the passing caravans. Ghost ships that from the desert seas loom silent through the steady beams, pale phantoms of elusive dreams, cargoed with ancient memories. Through the long night across the cool, black waters to their shrouded birth, bearing the treasures of the earth, glide the fair ships to Liverpool. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Seeing Things by Eugene Field A poem read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould I ain't afraid of snakes or toads or bugs or worms or mice And things that girls are scared of I think are awful nice I'm pretty brave, I guess, and yet I hate to go to bed For when I'm tucked up warm and snug and when my prayers are said Mother tells me, happy dreams, and takes away the light, and leaves me lying all alone and seeing things at night. Sometimes they're in the corner, sometimes they're by the door, sometimes they're all a-standin' in the middle of the floor. Sometimes they are a-sittin' down, sometimes they're walkin' round, so softly and so creepy-like they never make a sound. Sometimes they are as black as ink, and other times they're white. But color ain't no difference when you see things at night. Once, when I licked a feller that had just moved on our street, and father sent me up to bed without a bite to eat, I woke up in the dark and saw things standing in a row, a looking at me cross-eyed, and pintin' at me, so. Oh, my, I was so scared that time I never slept a mite. It's almost always when I'm bad I see things at night. 
Lucky thing I ain't a girl, or I'd be scared to death. Bein' I'm a boy, I duck my head and hold my breath. And I am oh so sorry I'm a naughty boy, and then I promise to be better and I say my prayers again. Grandma tells me that's the only way to make it right when a fella has been wicked and sees things at night. And so when other naughty boys would coax me into sin, I try to squash the tempter's voice that urges me within. And when they's pie for supper, or cake it's big and nice, I want to, but I do not pass my plate for them things twice. No, rather let starvation wipe me slowly out of sight, than I should keep a living on, and seeing things at night. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Shortness of Life by Francis Quarles Read for LibriVox.org by Phil Schempf And what's a life? A weary pilgrimage, whose glory in one day doth fill the stage with childhood, manhood, and decrepit age. And what's a life? The flourishing array of the proud summer meadow, which today wears her green plush, and is tomorrow hay, read on this dial how the shades devour my short-lived winter's day hour eats up hour alas the total's but from eight to four behold these lilies which thy hands have made fair copies of my life and open laid to view how soon they droop how soon they fade shade not that dial night will blind too soon my non-aged day already points to noon how simple is my suit, how small my boon. Nor do I beg this slender inch to while the time away, or falsely to beguile my thoughts with joy. Here's nothing worth a smile. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Shy Perfect Flower by Grace Fallow Norton Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo Shy, perfect, pearl-white flower Blooming alone In northern woods Where snow has sown Its myriad seed Shy, perfect flower Fragrant, alone Your dark leaves cluster close To hide you the more I part them and remember bright poppies on the plain. They run in the wind, a ragged gypsy train. They fling themselves at the feet of the golden grain. When it is slain, they too are slain. Their life is a cry. Their life is a sudden scarlet stain. Their dream dark seeds have fearful power. And you, shy perfect pearl white flower, and a poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Singing Woman from the Wood's Edge by Edna St. Vincent Millay. Read for LibriVox by Heath Ogden. What should I be but a prophet and a liar? whose mother was a leprechaun, whose father was a friar, teethed on a crucifix and cradled under water, what should I be but the fiend's goddaughter? And who should be my playmates but the adder and the frog that was got beneath the furze bush and born in a bog? And what should be my singing that was christened at an altar but aves and credos and psalms out of the psalter? You will see such webs on the wet grass, maybe, as a pixie mother weaves for her baby. You will find such flame at the wave's weedy ebb as flashes in the meshes of a mer-mother's web. But there comes to birth no common spawn from the love of a priest for a leprechaun. And you never have seen, and you never will see, such things as the things that swaddled me. After all's said and after all's done, 
What should I be but a harlot and a nun? In through the bushes on any foggy day, my da would come a-swishing of the drops away, with a prayer for my death and a groan for my birth, a mumbling of his beads for all that he was worth. And there'd sit my ma, with her knees beneath her chin, a-looking in his face and a-drinking of it in, and a-marking in the moss some funny little saying that would mean just the opposite of all that he was praying. He taught me the holy talk of Vesper and of Madden. He heard me my Greek and he heard me my Latin. He blessed me and crossed me to keep my soul from evil. And we watched him out of sight and we conjured up the devil. Oh, the things I haven't seen and the things I haven't known. What with hedges and ditches till after I was grown and yanked both ways by my mother and my father. With a which would you better, and a which would you rather? With him for a sire, and her for a dam, what should I be but just what I am? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Superba Lisette Camponeri Magnus by Marguerite Radcliffe Hall. Read for LibriVox.org by Matt Perard. In the bowl of a shell sings the wonderful song of the sea, all the ebb and the swell in the bowl of a shell. In the heart of a pool drifts the fathomless smile of the sky, all the clouds white and cool in the heart of a pool. In the beam of a star shines the light of a faraway world out of space dim and far in the beam of a star in the cup of a rose dwells the languor and passion of june eager life warm repose in the cup of a rose in the throat of a bird lives the message of god to his earth lo the mystical word in the throat of a bird end of poem this recording is in the public domain Song of Autumn by Charles Maurice Stebbins, read for LibriVox.org by Linda Olson Fytak, Los Angeles. Song of Autumn I come on the wings of the south wind, on the wings of the south and east. I tarry in forest and meadow, and spread out my harvest feast. I am life, I am death and harvest, the soul of the summer and spring the end of their budding and blooming of the months and the years i am king my coffers are full i give freely to the strong and the weak as well to man and the birds of the meadow the squirrel and fox in the dell for mine are the barley and wheat fields the apples of red and green the chestnuts of brown on the hilltops the fields of corn between for me grapes in purple clusters hang low on the rustic vine, And orchards of pears and peaches their garlanded heads incline. I bring unto all a blessing from inland lake to the sea, I strew the highlands with plenty, the valleys I fill with glee. No dingle may lie so hidden that I do not spy it out and fill with the wealth of my treasures each distant and secret redoubt. For all countries are my dominions, from pole to equator and pole, and my coursers are swift as the lightnings to bear me from goal to goal. My thanks are often but curses, yet still do I wander on, and gladly bestow my bounties till my wealth is vanished and gone. Then I flee on the wings of the north wind, on the wings of the north and west, and leave to the keeping of winter the lands that I have blessed. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sylvie et Aurélie 
by andrew lang read for LibriVox.org by sonia sylvie et aurélie in memory of gerard de nerval two loves there were and one was born between the sunset and the rain her singing voice went through the corn her dance was woven neath the thorn on grass the fallen blossoms stain and suns may set and moons may wane but this love comes no more again there were two loves and one made white thy singing lips and golden hair born of the city's mire and light the shame and splendour of the night she trapped and fled thee unaware not through the lamplight and the rain shalt thou behold this love again go forth and seek by wood and hill thine ancient love of dawn and dew there comes no voice from mere or rill her dance is over fallen still the ballad burdens that she knew and thou must wait for her in vain till years bring back thy youth again that other love a field afar fled the light love with lighter feet nay though thou seek where gravesteads are and flit in dreams from star to star that dead love shalt thou never meet till through bleak dawn and blowing rain thy soul shall find her soul again end of poem this recording is in the public domain Universal Humanity by William Blake from the Four Zoas, read for LibriVox.org. And as the seed waits eagerly, watching for its flower and fruit, anxious, its little soul looks out into the clear expanse to see if hungry winds are abroad with their invisible array. So man looks out in tree and herb and fish and bird and beast collecting up the scattered portions of his immortal body into the elemental forms of everything that grows he tries the sullen north wind riding on its angry furrows the sultry south when the sun rises and the angry east when the sun sets and the clods harden and the cattle stand drooping and the birds hide in the silent nests he stores his thoughts as in storehouses in his memory he regulates the forms of all beneath and all above and in the gentle west reposes where the sun's heat dwells he rises to the sun and to the planets of the night and to the stars that gild the zodiacs and the stars that sullen stand to north and south he touches the remotest pole and in the centre weeps that man should labour and sorrow and learn and forget and return to the dark valley whence he came and begin his labors anew in pain he sighs in pain he labors in his universe sorrowing in birds over the deep or howling in the wolf over the slain and moaning in the cattle and in the winds and weeping over orc and eurizon in clouds and dismal fires and in cries of birth and in the groans of death his voice is heard throughout the universe wherever a grass grows or a leaf buds the eternal man is seen is heard is felt and all his sorrows till he reassumes his ancient bliss end of poem this recording is in the public domain untitled by sydney lanier read for librivox dot org by matt perard when into reasonable discourse plain or russet terms of dealing in old use i would recast the joy the tender pain of the silver birch the rhododendron the brook or all blessed particulars of beauty sung in one most continent word that means something to all men to some men everything to one all but one will cover with satisfaction that is love yet i well know this tree is a selfish savour up of drink might else have nourished these laurels yea and they did not hand round the cup 
to the grass ere they drank nor the grass inquire if room is here for her and the flocks yet my spirit will have it that love is the lost meaning of this hate and peace the end of this battle why this is revelation here i find god what power less than his could fancy such wild inconsequence and reason as flies out of this anguish and love out of this murder end of poem this recording is in the public domain the vampire by john stagg read for librivox dot org by newgate novelist argument the story of the vampire is founded on an opinion or report which prevailed in hungary and several parts of germany towards the beginning of the last century it was then asserted that in several places dead persons had been known to leave their graves and by night to revisit the habitations of their friends whom by succosity they drained of their blood as they slept the person thus phlebotomized was sure to become a vampire in his turn and if it had not been for a lucky thought of the clergy who ingeniously recommended staking them in their graves we should by this time have had a greater swarm of bloodsuckers than we have at present numerous as they are many and ingenious were the animadversions both of the faculty and clergy to adopt some probable reasons for the physical cause of such an uncommon phenomenon it was asserted that a portion of the animal spirits not having escaped at the decease of the body had retained a power of volition and investing themselves with some part of the body which had not immediately yielded to putrefaction they were thus enabled to make those prodigious excursions from the grave and to return at pleasure without any apparent inconvenience others were of opinion that these were a class of demons who are supposed to be very numerous who getting possession of any human excrescences rendered themselves partially corporeal and perfectly visible at pleasure from some of our modern voyagers it appears that the notion of the existence of vampires was very generally known and credited among the dutch and some other settlements in america i do not imagine that a thousandth part of the world are acquainted with the reason why the secondine immediately after the nativity of the fetus is so carefully deflagrated by the obstetric and others who preside at the accouchement this was founded on the opinion that those numerous domestic demons of whom they had such a perfect belief were tenacious of any opportunity that furnished them with a means of obtaining any portion of humanity which they certainly preferred to any other animal substances we may suppose that the umbellicum would make a very desirable jerkin for one of these gentry hence it has been that since they had such a desire to render themselves in part corporeal and visible as it pleased them that when human excrescences were not easily obtainable they were forced to repair to the common slaughter-houses carrion heaps etc there to array themselves in such habiliments as chance threw in their way from which we may infer the reason so many of our common apparitions have perforce been compelled to appear in the forms of horses cows sheep asses dogs cats etc etc in fine every sort of animal so that many of these might in fact be said to be the ghosts of the animals they represented rather than of any particular person why looks my lord so deadly pale why fades the crimson from his cheek what can my dearest husband ail thy heartfelt cares o oh herman speak why at the silent hour of rest dost thou in sleep so sadly mourn as though with heaviest griefs oppressed griefs too distressful to be borne 
why heaves thy breast why throbs thy heart oh speak and if there be relief thy gertrude solace shall impart if not at least shall share thy grief wan is that cheek which once the bloom of manly beauty sparkling showed dim are those eyes in pensive gloom that late with keenest lustre glowed say why too at the midnight hour you sadly pant and tug for breath as if some supernatural power were pulling you away to death restless though sleeping still you groan and with convulsive horror start o oh, herman to thy wife make known that grief which preys upon thy heart o oh, gertrude how shall i relate the uncommon anguish that i feel strange as severe is this my fate a fate i cannot long conceal in spite of all my wonted strength stern destiny has sealed my doom the dreadful malady at length will drag me to the silent tomb but say my herman what's the cause of this distress and all thy care that vulture-like thy vital gnaws and galls thy bosom with despair sure this can be no common grief sure this can be no common pain speak if this world contain relief that soon thy gertrude shall obtain o oh, gertrude tis a horrid cause o oh, gertrude tis unusual care that vulture-like my vital gnaws and galls my bosom with despair young sigismund my once dear friend but lately he resigned his breath with others i did him attend unto the silent house of death for him i wept for him i mourned paid all to friendship that was due but sadly friendship is returned thy herman he must follow too must follow to the gloomy grave in spite of human art or skill no power on earth my life can save tis fate's unalterable will young sigismund my once dear friend but now my persecutor foul doth his malevolence extend e'en to the torture of my soul by night when wrapped in soundest sleep all mortals share a soft repose my soul doth dreadful vigils keep more keen than which hell scarcely knows from the drear mansions of the tomb from the low regions of the dead the ghost of sigismund doth roam and dreadful haunts me in my bed there vested in infernal guise by means to me not understood close to my side the goblin lies and drinks away my vital blood sucks from my veins the streaming life and drains the fountain of my heart o oh, gertrude gertrude dearest wife unutterable is my smart when surfeited the goblin dire with banqueting by suckled gore will to his sepulchre retire till night invites him forth once more then will he dreadfully return and from my veins life's juices drain whilst slumbering i with anguish mourn and toss with agonizing pain already i'm exhausted spent his carnival is nearly o'er my soul with agony is rent to-morrow i shall be no more but o oh my gertrude dearest wife the keenest pangs hath last remained when dead i too shall seek thy life 
thy blood by Hermann shall be drained but to avoid this horrid fate soon as i'm dead and laid in earth drive through my corpse a javelin straight this shall prevent my coming forth oh watch with me this last sad night watch in your chamber here alone but carefully conceal the light until you hear my parting groan then at what time the vesper bell of yonder convent shall be told that peal shall ring my passing knell and herman's body shall be cold then and just then thy lamp make bare the starting ray the bursting light shall from my side the goblin scare and show him visible to sight the livelong night poor gertrude sate watched by her sleeping dying lord the livelong night she mourned her fate the object whom her soul adored then at what time the vesper bell of yonder convent sadly tolled then then was pealed his passing knell the hapless herman he was cold just at that moment gertrude drew from neath her cloak the hidden light when dreadful she beheld in view the shade of sigismund sad sight indignant rolled his ireful eyes that gleamed with wild horrific stare and fixed a moment with surprise beheld a ghast thin lightning glare his jaws cadaverous were besmeared with clotted carnage o'er and o'er and all his horrid whole appeared distent and filled with human gore with hideous scowl the spectre fled she shrieked aloud then swooned away the hapless herman in his bed all pale a lifeless body lay next day in council twas decreed urged at the instance of the state that shuddering nature should be freed from pests like these ere twas too late the choir then burst the funeral dome where sigismund was lately laid and found him though within the tomb still warm as life and undecayed with blood his visage was disdained ensanguined were his frightful eyes each sign of former life remained save that all motionless he lies the corpse of herman they contrive to the same sepulchre to take and through both carcasses they drive deep in the earth a sharpened stake by this was finished their career through this no longer they can roam from them their friends have naught to fear both quiet keep the slumbering tomb end of poem this recording is in the public domain Happy Halloween! Virtues That Pay Poem by Joseph Furphy Read for LibriVox by Josh Middledorf Virtues That Pay You argue, as sympathy governs your bias, that wisdom distributes the capon and crust, indulging the sinful and stinting the pious, or starving the wicked and fattening the just. You are wrong to the evil one. Hear what I say. There are ruinous virtues and virtues that pay. If your purpose be saving your soul and your bacon, fruition forthwith and a sweet by and by, if your definite project stand clear and unshaken, 
a fat man on earth and a seraph on high. In working this out, let it still be your lay, there are ruinous virtues and virtues that pay. Such virtues are not of the workshop or cloister. They test every act by the way it pans out. They prompt you to seize on the world as your oyster, inserting your knife with a spirit of doubt. For straight is the portal and narrow the way, representing the rout of the virtues that pay. Men as good as yourself, or most probably better, have gone to the rear after many a try, a permanent wage-slave, a usurer's debtor, reduced to the motto of root hog or die. But their handicap dates from an earlier day when they failed in espousals of virtues that pay. There's nothing outré in the man with the bluey. He started, like you, for a goal undisclosed. But never in life can he come within cooey, though he may reach a goal with the vowels transposed. And a similar shoal gapes fair in your way if you turn out deficient in virtues that pay. You must race like St. Paul. You must race for the dollar. No pause of compunction must ever intrude. You must watch, you must pray, never missing a collar. The course is severe and the company good. You must reverence the thrift God and earnestly pray to be grounded and built up in virtues that pay. By this means you will serve the Almighty and Mammon and die in a state of salvation and wealth when the clergy without a suggestion of gammon will furnish your soul with a clean bill of health. So you'll sweep through the gates in your spotless array, a shining example of virtues that pay. End of poem. The Wanderer by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Wanderer There is nobody on the road but I, And no beseeming abode I can try for shelter, so abroad I must lie. The stars feel not far up, and to be the lights by which I sup, glimmeringly set out in a hollow cup over me. They wag as though they were panting for joy, where they shine above all care and annoy and demons of despair, life's alloy. Sometimes outside the fence, feet swing past clock-like and then go hence till at last there is a silence dense deep and vast a wanderer witch drawn to and fro to-morrow at the dawn on i go and where i rest anon do not know yet it's meet this bed of hay and roofless plight for there's a house of clay my own quite to roof me soon all day and all night. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The White Witch by James Weldon Johnson. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. O oh, brothers mine, take care, take care. The great white witch rides out tonight. Trust not your prowess nor your strength. Your only safety lies in flight. For in her glance there is a snare, and in her smile there is a blight. The great white witch you have not seen. Then, younger brothers mine, forsooth, like nursery children you have looked for ancient hag and snaggletooth. But no, not so. The witch appears in all the glowing charms of youth. Her lips are like carnations, red. Her face like newborn lilies, fair. Her eyes like ocean waters, blue. She moves with subtle grace and air. And all about her head there floats a golden glory of her hair. But though she always thus appears in form of youth and mood of mirth, 
unnumbered centuries are hers the infant planets saw her birth the child of throbbing life is she twin sister to the greedy earth and back behind those smiling lips and down within those laughing eyes and underneath the soft caress of hand and voice and purring sighs the shadow of the panther lurks the spirit of the vampire lies for i have seen the great white witch and she has led me to her lair and i have kissed her red red lips and cruel face so white and fair around me she has twined her arms and bound me with her yellow hair i felt those red lips burn and sear my body like a living coal obeyed the power of those eyes as the needle trembles to the pole and did not care although i felt the strength go ebbing from my soul oh she has seen your strong young limbs and heard your laughter loud and gay and in your voices she has caught the echo of a far-off day when man was closer to the earth and she has marked you for her prey she feels the old antian strength in you the great dynamic beat of primal passions and she sees in you the last besieged retreat of love relentless lusty fierce love pain ecstatic cruel sweet oh brothers mine take care take care the great white witch rides out tonight oh younger brothers mine beware look not upon her beauty bright for in her glance there is a snare and in her smile there is a blight End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The White Woman by John Stagg. Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. The manner from Lewis, though the tale is a fact. Johanna had reached the meridian of life was as fair as the blossom in june young frederick had recently made her his wife unenvied they lived without care without strife and their happiness seemed in its noon content at her wheel she would cheerfully sing through the length of the long summer day whilst he through the autumn the summer the spring industriously toiled their small pittance to bring for they both were as frugal as gay one day at the door of the alehouse they sat the villagers seated around twas holiday time and their neighbourly chat gave zest to their liquor though neither was flat as each care in a bumper was drowned around within view the whole village it lay which gave fair johanna her birth close at hand the old church you might easily survey the tall spreading ash and the steeple so gay though these objects took not from their mirth for innocence seldom can know that dismay that guilt's so oft doomed to sustain the heart of each rustic on that happy day beat high with contentment each visage was gay and joy seemed to spread through the train when sudden johanna with wild frantic roar cried save me or else i am gone the white woman's coming from yon churchyard door the cruel white woman i've seen her before <gasps> see this way she stalks all alone what woman cried frederick with ghastly surprise what woman there's none that i see yes yes the white woman johanna replies behold her lank form and her two flaming eyes i know that she's coming for me i saw the grave open i saw her come out her shroud is as white as the snow corruption besmears her foul temples about 
whilst volumes of worms from her mouth she casts out she comes for johanna i know and see through the churchyard enshrouded away the spectres and goblins they roam they seem with dire menace to chide her delay and shriek to the white woman come come away johanna must come to the tomb like furies but see how they tear up the mould they howl but how dismally drear like footballs the skulls of my kindred are rolled o'er the graves there the ghost of my mother behold oh save me the white woman's here i've seen her before i remember her well see faster and nearer she draws oh frederick her dreadful approaches repel bear me off force her back drive the beldam to hell ere i'm touched with her skeleton paws oh save me oh save me dear frederick her blast is as cold as his winter's cold breath she crawls up my clothes oh have mercy at last the cruel white woman embraces me fast and she says that her errand is death help help my dear frederick oh where are your hands those hands poor johanna should save the fiend has o'erpowered him he motionless stands although his sad wife the white woman demands and pulls me away to the grave no cruel white woman i'll not come at all my frederick shall bind up my head yet hark the fell furies incessantly call come come to yon churchyard you must and you shall for there we've prepared your last bed delirious and raving johanna was borne to her home and each cordial applied the fate of the poor hapless fair one they mourn whilst frederick all pensive in anguish forlorn the livelong night watched by her side all night in wild frenzy in horror and pain she starts with convulsive affright she shrieks the white woman with might and with main the cruel white woman again and again for the phantom still dwells on her sight next day more composed with the nightingale's lay she sung by her frenzy inspired from morning till evening she carolled away be gone thou white woman get from me i say nor once with her song ever tired the third morning came but she made no reply to a word that was asked or was said but still she kept chaunting white woman out fie get hence foul white woman i'll come by and by by eve-tide johanna was dead end of poem this recording is in the public domain wishing you a very spooky halloween